hello and welcome back and today i want to talk about the subject of heat sinks it's something i've talked about a lot in the second half of 2021 and now going into 2022 and a number of you are looking at upgrading the storage on your gaming pc or upgrading the storage in your ps5 a number of you are wondering about these two drives this is the wd black sn 850 and this is the seagate fire cuda 532 ssds that provide an enormous amount of performance an enormous amount of power and durability uh, durability endurance all of this to you the end user but a lot of you when you're buying these drives regardless of the controllers and the NAND and all the stuff we talked about in the reviews which I'm not going to go into too much detail on in today's video a number of you have noticed that these drives arrive with heat sinks pre-applied these are uh, predominantly metal casings that live on top or around the SSD and these devices dissipate heat from these drives what that means is that the components inside these get very very hot while the system's in operation and when they get hot that can often ruin their performance the NAND where your data lives can afford to get a little bit warm but the controllers the brains the CPU arguably of these devices if they get too hot performance will drop as the system will throttle what's going through in order to maintain the durability and the lifespan of the SSD so Today's video, we are looking at these two, although we of course have talked about the high performance in the past and they're both bloody good SSDs, the main focus of today's video is temperature testing. This video is going to comprise three parts, right here on screen, don't worry, it's all in one video. First part of this video is going to be us talking about their design, what they've done, how they've applied it and what we think of both of their heat sinks. Part two is going to be bench testing on a PC and we're going to do extensive write activity on these two SSDs and then we're going to monitor the temperature reports afterwards to see how they compared, where were the highs, where were the lows and ultimately which one dissipated the heat the best because remember it's about not how hot they get um, because again that's not going to matter, it's the amount of heat that these heat sinks are able to draw from the important components and dissipate into the air that's what's key here and the last part of this video is us getting these inside a ps5 system and running some extensive gameplay to see what happens and what temperature is maintained on these drives after a certain period of time and which one managed to maintain a decent little heat point on the ssd so let's talk about these two ssd heat sinks now unsurprisingly when it comes to any ssd on the market if you buy them without the heat sink they tend to cost less there's less hardware there's less components to play with it's unsurprising indeed a lot of heat sinks on the market can range from very affordable little m2 heat sinks that can knock around for about 10 to 15 quid up to enterprise grade heat sinks like this one which again will knock around for about 20 to 25 quid there's even if i can dig it out there if i can reach it um dedicated ps5 heat sinks as well sorry it's already plugged into a system there uh, around the back but there's dedicated ps5 heat sinks like this one that can be utilized quite well and again these are designed for ps5 systems so again more designed more um, engineer led heat sinks will tend to cost you more but at the very top end in terms of expensive heat sinks pre-applied first party heat sinks are always the most expensive so whereas all the heat sinks i've discussed so far can range from about 10 quid to about 25 quid these heat sinks can often increase the price per terabyte of your ssd somewhere between 30 to 50 and in some cases you know 60 or 70 dollars there per terabyte i mean the samsung 980 pro version that's coming out at the end of the year that is an enormous jump in terms of price over the non heat sink version so these cost more why if we look at the design one of the first telltale signs should be available to you there these are fully surrounding heat sinks all the way around our ssds with the m2 at the top these are heat sinks that have been applied at the factory level that means unlike when you try to apply a heat sink yourself where you've got to start taking it apart getting a the little thermal pads inside and ultimately taking the heat sink um, and applying it to the ssd personally in you know an area where there may be maybe dust on stuff like that the result is there may be little fibers or something between the ssd and the heat sink which may marginally 
affect heat dissipation in some way to not be so good. The other thing worth bearing in mind while we look inside this heatsink, you can see that giant thermal pad on either side, on either side of this heatsink here. Now, that's because this heatsink, although it's designed for use with Sabrent SSDs, this one can be used with loads of different ones. Consequently, they have to be a bit more generic about how that thermal pad is applied. It's ultimately going to cover the whole SSD. And if you remember at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that although most SSDs have got multiple chips and you want to keep the thing um, nice and cool by dissipating that heat, some chips need more cooling than others. So the NAND, that can dissipate a bit of heat, but the main focus needs to be the controller. You need that to get as much heat dissipated and taken away as possible and first party heat sinks when they're designed at the factory level they know which ssd they're going to be going on so consequently both of these heat sinks inside utilize thermal padding that is either thicker or cut directly onto the controller it's directly on there to make sure it dissipates that heat and then there are gaps within the thermal pad on each of the different components the result is that both the thermal pad being cut to the most important areas of the SSD and the very design of these heat sinks to dissipate heat in the right key areas on board result in first party heat sinks being applied at a dust free factory level and at a far more efficient and effective manner, hence the more expensive price tags. Between the two of these, I've got to say in terms of design and how they look, I prefer the Fire Cuda. But from what I can see and stuff we've seen online, that I am probably in the minority, largely because the WD utilizes a lot of ventilation. And if you're a PC player, that may make all the difference for you because you've got air circling around that PC case. And the idea that some of the air can make its way through that heatsink is going to be very advantageous to you there. Me, as more of a console gamer, that's going to be less of a concern for me. And I want a heat sink that's gonna dissipate as much in a surface area as possible. Hence why I quite like the chunky solid heat sink that's being utilized here that's comparable to the Elotangs. But again, that is a preference and something that is very much based on your own applications and by no means an endorsement for either one of these two brands. It's just a preference. Now, what we're gonna do now is take both of these SSDs and the specifications I'm sure have been on screen, so we're not gonna talk about them much just on the heat sinks, we're gonna take each of these SSDs individually and install them on the spare slot of the PCIe Gen 4 x 4 test machine. And then we're gonna perform some extensive activity identical on both systems. We are not going to look at performance unless it drops significantly because of heat temperatures, because that's something we're gonna look at. What we are looking at in our recording isn't performance, it's heat. We're gonna see how regularly these drives fill up with heat. They're both one terabyte, and we're gonna write a pile of data to them and see how things fare. The only time I think it's worth mentioning endurance is to bear in mind that this drive is rated at 0.3 drive writes per day, and this one is rated at 0.7. So that means on the terabyte, this is rated for around 300 gigabytes to be written per terabyte every day, and this is rated at 700. That's something that we're going to need to maybe look at later on when we're writing all that data to see if that crunch point between 300 and 700 manifests itself. But for now, let's get to part two of this video where we move this into the PC test scenario and right there at the end, we'll crack on with the PS5. Let's go. Right, so we've made our way onto the desktop here and what I'm going to be doing now is running a similar test on both the WD Black SN850 and the Seagate Fire Cuda 530. I apologise for some background humming here. I've got a few NAS devices quite close to this desktop setup and I'm trying to eradicate as much of the noise as I can but unfortunately it's all present. Also I'm going to be recording this in OBS and putting both of these side by side on screen for you now. What I'm going to do is run AJA for some extensive constant write activity to both of these SSDs exactly the same setup and we're going to be monitoring their individual temperatures I'm going to do that recording now and then I'm going to come back to it for you guys so we can go over both of these as they make both of their respective recordings throughout this uh, test to see just how high the temperature reaches for both of them we're not looking at performance remember that we are not looking at performance the only thing we care about 
is temperature so right now you can see the refresh there it's going to be auto refreshing every one minute so again we are going to be manually refreshing it throughout but predominantly we are looking at the temperature there and at the moment we can see the Seagate there for me on screen but at the end of this we'll go through both of them so without further ado let's start and begin our tests Okay, so we started off the test on both of these SSDs simultaneously with this one gigabyte constant read and write action in AJA. And straight away, it's very clear to see that the WD certainly ran hotter very early doors. Once again, we said we weren't really going to pay too much attention to performance there. And of course, there are dips during the oversaturation of memory and stuff like that. So we're not really going to look at that. But what I really wanted to take on board here is the way that temperature is is rising notably between the two of them. We've got this over 10 minutes of constant one gigabyte read-write um, bombardment on these SSDs that's running at five times speed, this 10 minute session. And even early doors, it was quite clear that the WD's general operational temperature when we were setting up the SSD there was higher. Now at the end of this uh, little two minute speed up session here, I'm gonna go through a graph with you but I wanted to show you some of the in situ performance there all the way through because yes, the WD did run hotter, but it is also worth highlighting that WD did still maintain that performance with only the occasional dip. The Seagate as well did a nice high performance there. Fewer dips, arguably, not too fewer, but definitely uh, the odd few less. And then on top of that, there was the fact that the Seagate there clearly was running at the lower temperature. Early doors in idle and later on throughout sustained performance. With the WD there reaching heights of the 50s and the 60s, you can see in the red box there, do make sure you're watching this at least 1080p full screen, and the Seagate there only later in the test reaching into the 40 mark there. Now again, these are SSDs, I'm going to bring up the graph shortly, but it was still really intriguing to see, at least in this PC bombarding, bombardment and sustain test, those temperatures. So let's take a moment and have a look through the graph of results. So looking at both of these graphs side by side on screen, uh, you can ignore the bulk of the stuff on the left, that's the general operational temperature in the history, and what we want to look at is the far right hand side of either graph. As you can see there, the WD started at an idle of around 31C, and then started leaping from 38, and then right into the 50s and the 60s during the more sustained utilization of that one gig test. The Fire Cuda, on the other hand, in this PC setup, started much, much lower in idle at 17 to 18 there, thanks to the heat dissipation of that heatsink, just seemingly being a great deal better in the operation of the PC. Fast forwarding there, reaching all the way to the top uh, at 45C. So again, not a tremendous amount of worry there in terms of what we're seeing. And I would argue definitely that between the two of them in a PC setup, the Seagate Fire Cuda heatsink there was certainly the one that was doing a much better job of dissipation. They both performed very well but heat dissipation, at least in the PC instance here, was certainly greater on the Fire Cuda. So let's switch over to the PS5 temp testing to see how these compare against PlayStation 5 heat dissipation on their SSD. Right, so our first test, like, much like my previous heatsink test, was performed with Red Dead Redemption. This first test you're seeing here on screen is with a thermal node on the controller of each of these 1TB SSDs. As the description at the bottom says, uh, all of these tests are performed with the node directly on top of the controller, underneath both the heatsink and the thermal padding, as well as being inside the PS5 with the M2 plate attached over the top and all side panels of the PS5 in place. Now immediately just like our PC testing one of the earliest indications we saw there was that the SSD did indeed run a little hotter there at the beginning for that WD black. The WD black there starting very much in the late 30s there at 38.9 it was at when we were playing this game right from the beginning on autopilot whereas the Fire Cuda 530 starting at a much lower 33.7. We can't overlook ambient general room temperature, but still that is a very distinct difference between these two temperatures. And that difference there, although they started at very different temps, it is worth highlighting that they 
overall throughout this test didn't really rise more than a few degrees on either SSD. Indeed, the WD Black there at the top left of the screen was the first to go into the 40s, of course, more than any other SSD heatsink I looked at, even generic M2 heatsinks. But again, a lot of that is to do with that SSD just being slightly hotter running overall. But nevertheless, as this test continued, we can see that although they started at different temperatures, the general increase throughout the process of both of these games that we're going to be looking at what you'll see is the increase in temperature between both SSDs is largely the same with the exception of a couple of occasions that we'll talk about later on. In terms of Red Dead Redemption and the controller temperature there running in the background, easily the WD Black was the high attempt start. However, the Fire Cuda actually overall, right away on the points, actually was a higher increase overall with the uh, controller temperature at the end of this test ending at 36.3 on the Seagate and 42.2 on the WD Black. So the WD Black overall was the higher temp, but the Seagate Fire Cuda was 3.4 degrees increase over the playtime, whereas WD was 3.3. A very minor difference there, but still nonetheless, just a small thing to give the WD Black overall between the two of them. Let's now test the general temperature. Now the general temperature of the PS5 is the other concern when it comes to any heatsink. Now what I meant by this was that unlike our previous test here on Red Dead when we had the first temperature node on the controller of the SSD, in this occasion we've got a secondary node that lives outside of the SSD. This node outside of the SSD, outside of the M2 SSD expansion bay, was placed one inch underneath the central core fan of the PS5. What we were looking at here was when the SSD was in operation and with the heatsink and the M2 cover plate of the PS5, did it generate enough heat to affect the ambient temperature outside of the storage bay because that hot air or at least slightly increased temperature there would be fed into the PS5 with its CPU, GPU, memory and more. Now once again between these two SSDs there is little difference. Another thing that's definitely worth looking at was that both of them regardless of the internal temperature that both SSDs were achieving because of their architecture outside of that the actual ambient temperature of the PS5 outside of the storage bay was largely identical, with the WD starting at 25.9C and the Seagate at 24.5C, only about a degree difference between them. So again, very small differences there that can largely be put down to the ambient temperature in the air that day, with both of these tests being recorded on different days of the week. Consequently, I think it's safe to say that at least in the case of this game test, the temperatures raised on either heatsink had little or no impact on the overall system temperature. And as both of these continued, we can see that the increase between them was pretty small indeed, not even a degree. Overall, towards the end of this um, uh, ambient temperature test on Red Dead Redemption and the PS5, we saw that the WD Black SN850 raised temperature by a simple 0 0.2 degrees. That's, you know, a fifth of a degree, which is nothing really. Whereas the Seagate increased things by 0 0.3, a third of a degree. Once again, such a small amount, it's unreal. And between the two of them, it definitely showed that both heat sinks in this test did not do anything to negatively impact the overall temperature of the system when in operation. So now we're going to move on to another open world game, of course, another Rockstar Classic GTA. We're going for these larger open world sandbox games, and we're going to repeat these tests of the controller and general temperature now. Now it's worth highlighting during the course of this next test with GTA that although it's running on the same PS5 system and both tests were technically done on the same day as the previous tests, with this what happened was we shut down Red Dead Redemption, left the system turned off for around a minute to a minute and a half, then rebooted the PS5. So both of these gaming instances are playing from technically cold boot, but both of them are running 
very similarly to the previous test. The result was that a lot of the ambient temperature was still present. And once again, the WD Black started with a temperature there that went up and started at 39.8. Whereas the Seagate Fire Cuda this time was not given quite enough time to dissipate that heat. And this one started at 34.3. Now, what was really intriguing here was that the Seagate Fire Cuda obviously hadn't dissipated all of the heat from the previous test. However, the increase throughout the course of the GTA test was remarkably small. And by that, what I mean is the Seagate Fire Cuda, and you'll see this more at the end of this test, started at 34.3 and ended at 34.4. That's 0.1 degrees of increase. The heatsink had already largely reached the maximum temp it was ever going to reach in this game. And that was because we hadn't allowed a little bit more time to allow it to dissipate. Which is a great sign. If 34.4 was as high as this SSD was going to get in this open world game. Now the WD Black on the other hand... That still had that same level of increase and still reached its same max capacity. It just hadn't dissipated as much, uh, hadn't dissipated all of its heat either, starting at 39.8 and ending things at 41.6. That meant between these two games that even though there'd been a couple of minutes uh, cold boot between each of the tests so far, the controller that we're looking at here raised 1.8 degrees on the WD Black and 0.1 degrees on the Fire Cuda. It largely verified the previous controller testing that we did just now on Red Dead Redemption, but what was really intriguing there was that Seagate Fire Cuda, it didn't just jump another two to three degrees like the previous test. It had clearly shown that this was the max temp it was gonna achieve in this kind of scenario. But now let's retest the ambient temperature straight away here on the same game. That of course is GTA. Let's run that test now. Now the ambient temperature test of both these SSDs inside the PS5 system, just like before, one inch away from the central uh, fan system of the PS5 that's drawing in the air, the system already managed to get temperatures largely down to identically where they were before. With the WD Black test system here having an ambient PS5 internal temperature of 25.6 at the start and the Seagate flat on 24. Really, really similar to that of the previous test, clearly showing that the internal system's temperature was still very much staying on top of keeping those temps at a great temperature. Now, as the air is passing through this system, it is worth also mentioning that the fans didn't kick in. There was nothing overly aggressive about the system having to work hard on a hot SSD heatsink. There was none of that here. In both instances, the PlayStation 5 ran like a charm. Yes, we're fast-forwarding the footage here and the gameplay was considerably longer, but still, the system ran at a great temperature there with no problems encountered along the way. Now, as these were ending, both of these did technically increase in temperature a little bit more than the test would have Red Dead Redemption, but I think a lot of that is to do with the cooldown that we gave the system in between. So in the case of the WD Black, we saw it max out at the end of this test session at 26.1 degrees that meant an increase of just 0.5 degrees throughout the test session in the ambient temperature during gta 5. the seagate fire cuda 530 on the other hand started at 24 and ended at 24.6 so an increase of 0.6 degrees that's 0.1 higher than that of the wd much like before so, in the case of both SSDs, I think this largely sewed things up for me that neither one of these heat tinks would bear any kind of negative temp effects on the rest of the core system. The WD in both instances clearly had the larger increase of heat generated, just like it indicated in the PC tests. But in terms of ambient system temperature and the impact of these heat sinks on the wider system temp was very small indeed. Next up, we're going to be looking at testing read and write temperatures of sustained performance. We're going to be transferring a load of data, 350 to 380 gigabytes, over to each SSD and then back onto the BS5 SSD to see how these temperatures raise across both systems. Unlike normal gameplay, which will have more sporadic light access, this is going to be heavy duty work. 
Now it's worth highlighting that the test which you're seeing here on screen, which is a um, heavy read operation, is not really kind of um, indicative of when you're using the system more typically. As I mentioned, when you are playing a game, read activity is something that's going to be happening with the SSD, but it's very front loaded. All of the heavy duty stuff happens right at the beginning when you are loading the game. Then later on, there's going to be periodic reading of much smaller data to load things in world assets, textures and the like, as well as non-loading games that do silent loading where your characters slow down or the game will have a fixed camera so it can load assets into the background. Now, the reason we're doing sustained performance here is for those bigger games. We're transferring a lot of data over here, a big old pile of games onto these SS uh, from these SSDs back onto the system PS5 SSD, okay? So what you're seeing here on screen is all of this game data already being on the WD uh, Black or Seagate Vicuda SSD, but being moved now back over to the system's own internal PS5 SSD there. We're not looking at the performance speed, we're looking at the temperature that's being generated between them because it's clear, very early doors there on screen, there's a distinct difference between them. And then now as we look at the results, we can see that that WD Black that started at 31.4C ended at around 44.4C overall. The Seagate, on the other hand, starting at 33.1 and ending at 40.9, showed that it not only started um, a little higher, but it lowered the temperature increase overall, with the WD at 13 degrees and the Seagate at 7.8 degrees during the heavy read operation. But what about write? Let's check that out now. During this write operation, what we did here was move all of that data back onto the WD Black or Seagate Fire CUDA SSD. Both 1TB, easily able to accommodate the 350 to 380 gigabytes of data that's getting moved over. And we did shut down the system between both of these operations for a couple of minutes and reboot to give the, the system time to reassess and sort its own heatsink and dissipation out. Now, in both of these read and write tests, we were only looking at the controller temperature because we wanted to see any kind of negative effects on these SSDs. And in terms of their temperature, you can clearly see that the Seagate definitely dissipated most of the heat that it had generated a great deal quicker, starting at 27 degrees, whereas the WD Black started things at 33.4 degrees there. Now, between the two of them, the performance was largely the same, and this isn't a huge surprise due to the PS5 having some kind of encryption or compression bottleneck in the middle that kind of stops the true write performance of these SSDs truly being realized in sustained performance like this. In-game uh, performance being a great deal better, but in standard transfer from the internal PS5 SSD onto your M2 SSD, there's a marked difference in performance. We're only looking at temps. And once again, this is where we saw that the Seagate once again started at a lower temp, but also its overall increase in temperature was noticeably lower. Indeed, the WD Black didn't just start hotter than the Fire Cuda, but also it went to one of the highest temperatures we've seen from an SSD during these operations, with the exception of a few QLC NAND SSDs out there. Towards the end of this, as we are moving this data over, indeed, the PS5's internal fan actually did ramp up ever so slightly. Bear in mind, of course, what we're doing here is not atypical of standard use. This is very much a one-off scenario of sustained activity. But even now, with both of the jobs completed, we can see with both of them concluding at markedly different um, overall uh, controller temperatures that there was a definite increase, a notable increase difference there on the WD Black. With the WD Black SSD during this heavy write operation increasing in temperature at 17.2 degrees, whereas the Seagate Fire Cuda increased 12 degrees. Both of them much larger than we've seen before, as you would ex expect from such a sustained write activity, but still nonetheless, the Seagates were certainly able to dissipate that heat better 
and was the slightly cooler SSD controller during all of these tests. And ultimately, although both of these are different SSD builds, the heat sinks between them, I'm erring in PS5 degrees to say that the Firecuda did the better inside the PS5 SSD slot. Let's summarize everything we've learned today now. So, after all of that testing on PC and PS5, what have we seen? Well, realistically, if we just go by the numbers, the Seagate Firecuda 530's heatsink certainly maintained temperatures. Now, a lot of that, of course, we can't overlook the architecture of these individual SSDs. They've both got different controllers. They've both gone for different kinds of NAND on board. They are different SSDs under those heatsinks. But as we said, we were looking at core temperature. And whether that is us looking at the uh, heatsink or that is looking at how heavy and how hot these SSDs run, the Seagate Firecuda one, I would say at least four out of every five tests when it came to that PC benchmark there, it did run at a higher performance threshold, which we didn't really look at on purpose, but certainly with a lower initial temperature and throughout the course of the sustained 10 minute um, one gigabyte AJA constant testing, this was consistently under 50C. Never crossed into the 50s, it stayed well within those 40s. Whereas the WD Black, it has to be said, started up hot and only got hotter. So again, between the two of them, when it comes to an SSD, if you're going to do sustained performance, whether it's on a PC utilization or sustained, sustained use within a console environment, which is going to be a little bit more niche, with those heavy read writes that we did at the end of the console testing there, the Seagate Fire Cuda is definitely going to be the drive for you. That doesn't discount the WD Black when it did have the lower temperature jump in its utilization. It was when the games are being played. It definitely delivered the data well. And when we were looking at the test with Red Dead Redemption and GTA, it did on a few occasions have a lower overall increase in temperature over time than uh, that of the Seagate Fire Cuda. But even then, with recordings done at different times, ambient temperature has to be factored in but nonetheless these are both great ssds when it comes to heat sink i've got to say for me the fire cuda took the lip, the win for this one so thank you so much for watching if you've enjoyed this video chuck me a like it genuinely helps this channel and it helps me understand what you guys like and make each video better than the last if you want to learn more about this subject or look at more comparisons for not only heat sinks and ssds but whole storage systems in general click subscribe and the bell to be notified as more videos become live and of course if you're still unsure about what's the right system you need then do take advantage of the free advice section I've written as compared it's linked to the description i help you with data i'll help you with networking it's a completely free service manned by me and eddie the web guy two humans who answer as many emails as we can genuinely free we don't do anything for email couldn't care less about your email to be honest there's a donate button use it ignore it it's up to you it might take us an extra day or so to answer your inquiry because we are humans with lives but we do genuinely try to answer everyone thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time